Hey guys, I'm Devin, your friendly neighborhood board gamer, and this is Devin Talks Tabletop, a YouTube channel where the games are made up and what I say doesn't matter. Welcome back. I thought I would roll right back into it with Veiled Fate because I just got done talking about Moonrakers. If you haven't seen that video, you can check it out. I don't have a place for you to check it out. I'm not, I'm not there yet in terms of the quality of what I have provided for you, the fans, the community, my friends. But we're just going to roll right past that and move on. So first impressions, which if you saw the Moonrakers video, I definitely do not have that structured outline or the point by point steps of what I would say. Don't have that with me. Don't have it even in the foggiest part of my brain. It's just gone. Like Swiss cheese, like a broken sieve, my brain is empty. This is a first impressions of Veiled Fate. So I, I'm biased about this game. I'm happy to say that, but it's not for all of the reasons that you might think. If you are aware of the videos I've done with Jesse, you would know that I wrote the lore for this game. So they have a PDF lore book that's about 120 pages long. 60 pages of it is art. The other 60 pages of it is my lore. And that comprises... What is in there is this. I've got a prologue for the world and Aridin and why life is the way it is. I've got backstories for all nine of the demigods. I've got synopses for the locations. I've got resolution text for which one wins at the end of the game. And then the biggest thing is the city and age cards all have text resolution and explanations. But the biggest thing is that all 36 quests have a narrative beginning and then resolution for each slot in the quest on both Feathers and Scorpion's side. It was a lot. And I really enjoyed it, but it was, also, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot of writing. So I am commercially or contractually invested in this game. But that's not even just it. I'm also biased on this because... If you dial back the clock, is that even a thing? Dial back the clock? If you rewind the clock, yeah, sure, we'll go with that. If you rewind the clock even further, Veiled Fate is the first Kickstarter I ever backed. I saw all of the fantastic marketing by Ivy Studios. They do a great job digital marketing on social media and stuff like that whenever they have anything that's going on. I was made aware of it through that, and it's the first game I ever backed on Kickstarter, which has a certain level of nostalgia and appreciation there for me. It's also just the type of game that I would naturally like. I like bluffing games. I got into the hobby with stuff like Coup. I really enjoy experiences like Secret Hitler. As long as those social deduction games or those bluffing games are backed up by mechanics that mitigate the negative downside of when people have to interact. Because sometimes you get people that don't want to have to exhaust a lot of social energy to deal with exhausting personalities or deal with the, the need to project an illusion, a truth, whatever it is. It's a emotionally or socially taxing ask. And if a game does enough to mitigate that, it makes me happy. So they coined the term or labeled this as strategic deduction, which I think it does well. You can bluff and talk as much as you want. You can bluster, you can bloviate, you can deceive, you can do whatever you want, but you also don't have to. You can just play it slyly and coyly and have them... The, you can have everyone else be the ones talking. You can just work in the background and make sure that you obfuscate what you're doing and to where they can't pick up your trail. It's possible to do both. And it also has such a wide player count that you can create different unique experiences. You can kind of have the party game where you have seven people, but you can also have a really tight two-player game where you're always doubting there's a better chance that you're not activating somebody else's demigod because there's only maybe one other person at the table with you but you also don't know. And so trying to figure out who's maneuvering who is very clever. 
So my first impressions of this game, and I would have done an unboxing for this, but I did it in one of my YouTube shorts, mainly because I was just excited to open it and check it out. But I, I liked it a lot. I had a really good time. I played a three-player game with Jesse and Shira back before that at PAX Unplugged. I took one of their table copies and I played a four-player game with me, my brother, my cousin, and Jeremy Howard. And prior to that, I played at Gen Con. I think it was Gen Con. Yeah, I played at Gen Con for just one age out of the three because we couldn't play the full time. And then I also watched a lot of gameplays whenever I backed the campaign. So I, I've done it enough to where I feel like I can provide I can provide a first impressions. This is very satisfying. There's a surprising level of card management in it that you wouldn't expect upon first examination. And I mean that in relation to the fate cards. The fate cards are what you use to vote. You use those to vote on quests and you use those to vote on age. Like the end of each age, you'll have a global vote. Control of the amount of fate cards you have can really make or break some moments for you and create some really powerful control in certain votes that you really need to keep. At the end of each age, you'll, you'll get five new fate cards. And there's a maximum of eight you can have. But if you always have a fake card advantage over other players, it can give you a lot of strength. And so making sure that you're not just doling those out and sending people on quests, sending people on quests, and never replenishing the amount of cards you have definitely means that you will, you will maybe lose some very important or pivotal votes that other people are just going to have more economy of cards to beat you out on in terms of which way it sways. There's also so many ways to play this. You can play really heavy for the for your demigod that nobody else. You can play it really heavy from the beginning and just play it to where they they can't they they wouldn't possibly peg that you're actually going for your demigod because who would be so brash? You could play it to where you're always at certain points giving them a little bit of a cushion to where that they stick with the front runners the whole time or stay in the middle of the pack. You can play it to where you never touch your person at all and you just try to nuke other people until the very end and then you push your person heavy. All of that is a potential thing. I, I really enjoy it. I think it's got a lot of clever mechanisms to it. I'm really interested to see how diverse the player count experience is because I, I do think it's going to be something special. When you get to those higher player counts, you actually have teams. You just don't know who your teammate is. And one person is going for the same demigod that you are. You're just not sure who. That, I think, would create an extra layer of social anxiety in a good way as you are constantly evaluating the maneuvers of the other people around the table. I'm not going to say opponents because they may not be. And so you're trying to always evaluate what the other people are doing. And if they're positioning themselves to advance your person or obviously someone else's. That doesn't happen at the lower player counts out of necessity. But at the higher player counts, you need to not have everybody have their own demigod because then there's not enough nuance of who someone is not. If you have everybody on teams, then you still have a similar number of demigods who aren't being used, which means they're good as bluffs and they're good masks for what you're doing behind the scenes. Really enjoy this. I think it's got a lot of clever stuff going on. I can't, I, I'm, I'm curious to see if, because I, I know that Moonrakers has been out for a little bit and it's getting some expansions. I wonder what expansion content would mean for Veiled Fate. I'm curious to see how what, what that would do because I, I don't have any instinctual thoughts as to how it would improve the gameplay or change the gameplay or open up an avenue that's not there that might entice other players or keep it fresh enough that people are coming back to it. This is the kind of game though that you don't really get tired of the content because it's not the content that drives the game, it's the people that drive the game. If you, you could play Veiled Fate six or seven times with the same person and finally get into a rhythm. And then you have two options. You could be bored of playing the game with that person. Or you could, now that you know how they play the game, it enters a next level of, oh, I know how they play the game. 
but wait, are they going to play the game like how I know they will? Or are they going to mix it up because they now know that I know that? And then you could also, if you get tired with it though, play it with someone else. And it's going to be an entirely new experience because they're going to approach the deception part of this game and the strategy part of this game differently. And you essentially have to sense out a new opponent and figure out their tells, figure out their strategy. And I th think that that is... I think that's why I like games that focus on player interaction because they have, to me, that they have maybe the widest spectrum of satisfaction. You can have really bad games that, and I, I don't mean the game itself. You can have bad experiences with games based off of who you play with. But also, if you find the right people to play with, you could have maybe a higher potential for satisfaction playing a game than if you're just playing something where the core reward is purely the mechanics of the game and not how the people around you engage with it, if that makes any sense. Veiled Fate, really enjoy it. Cannot wait to play it again. This is another one that I've had the pleasure of playing up in Cleveland. We'll probably maybe play it again sometime. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's, that's it. For that one it's it's nice you should think about it though i don't know i don't know the availability though that's one thing maybe i shouldn't talk about something that maybe won't be readily available but i i it's board games i can't do that one of the games i'm about to talk about is definitely not readily available but i'm still going to talk about it i think they will have copies available from their web store or from their their website once fulfillment ends so have a good one.